Well, thank you everybody for joining um, today's webinar. Welcome to this month's ISFE webinar entitled The Use of Motory Electric Fields in Sustainable Processing of Foods by Professor James Ling. Professor Ling is the head of the Food and Nutrition Section at University College Dublin, UCD. Since his appointment to the academic staff of UCD, he has single-handedly uh, developed an entirely new area of research in emerging and green food processing technologies. This research focuses on emerg emerging thermal, such as microwave, radio frequency, wave and moderate electric field heating, and also non-thermal technologies like ultrasound, high voltage fields, electric fields, and light in food processing, including the assessment for preservation, um, the impact on product quality and nutritional value, the potential for food waste valorization, and the role in the bioeconomy. In his time at UCD, he has attracted more than 5.7 million of funding, um, euros, sorry, a million of funding, edited two books, published 16 book chapters, and more than 170 peer review publications with an age factor of 41. He is a co-PI in the SFI Biorbic Center and is a member of its executive spokes leadership team and scientific committee. He has partnered in European projects, recently completed the coordination of an era net project in moderate electric fields in food processing. Professor Ling lectures in food process technology for physics and coordinates the professional work experience program for food science. Now, before we start, please remember to mute, mute your microphone during the presentation. If you have questions through it, you can write them on the chat so that you do not forget them. And at the end, you can ask them directly to our speaker, and I can also read them aloud for you. Thank you so much for being here with us, Professor Ling, and now it's your audience. Thanks. Thank you very much for the very kind uh, introduction, uh, Vera Diana. Um, I'm, I'm, so I'm conscious I'm speaking to a, a, maybe a global audience today spread across many time zones. So I suppose good morning, good afternoon, good evening or good night to you, wherever you may be. Um, uh, my name is Jim Ling. Uh, the talk of today's presentation is the use of modern electric fields in sustainable processing of foods. And before I'd like to begin, uh, I would just like to thank the International Society of Food Engineering for organizing today's seminar and for the, and the, their president, uh, Jorg Welty Chen, is for inviting me here uh, to speak to you today. And uh, in brief, where I come from, uh, I'm, I'm the head of the food and nutrition section at UCD. Um, University College Dublin is uh, in, 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 in Dublin and it's very close to the city centre. It occupies a 133 hectare campus. It's Ireland's largest university. We've approximately 34,000 students from 139 countries. About 8,000 of those students are overseas, uh, you know, are international students, and 9,500 are approximately our graduate students, and about uh, 1,600 are PhD students. I'm in uh, the food science and nutrition section, but our university has many people across the campus interested in food. So we have what's called the Institute of Food and Health, which isn't the physical building on campus, but it basically comprises anyone in the university who has an interest in food, be they from law or from veterinary or from medicine or from food science or from agriculture. Uh, it's a forum for us to get together. And there are 33 academic staff in that forum, about 58 postdocs and 154 PhDs approximately. So I teach on the food science program, uh, but my research is very much in the area of novel processing technologies. And in terms of a, an overview of what I want to talk to you about today, I'm going to start off with a brief overview of really the societal challenges and really the role of green processing in, in all the challenges that society faces today. And then I'm going to introduce modern electric fields to you. And then I'm going to go on to talk about the status of modern electric fields. And I'm going to approach that from two perspectives. I'm going to initially look at it from a thermal perspective, but then I'm also going to look at modern electric fields for non-thermal applications. And I'll come at that from two angles. I'll talk initially about microbial inactivation, and then I'll talk about non-microbial cells, and then I'll try and round it all off with uh, some future prospects for moderate electric fields in sustainable processing of foods. So in brief, the challenges the world's food uh, system 
faces at the moment are very, very great. Uh, the first one, I'm sure you're well aware of it, is the projected uh, massive increase in global population from 7.5 to 9.7 billion by 2050. The implications of that, of course, is a massive increase in the amount of food production required, and that will require significant economic development. The second challenge is food production and manufacturing. It's a significant consumer of energy, uh, and equally, it's a contributor to uh, CO2 and global glass, you know, greenhouse gas emissions and so on. So that's something that 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 is a problem and that needs to be addressed if we're to, uh, you know, keep our global temperature or prevent this one to two degree temperature increase uh, that we we're trying to avoid. The third area is consumer demand. Consumers are demanding increasingly, uh, you know, healthy, nutritious, high quality, safe products. Uh, they're looking for more mildly processed products. And they're looking for products that retain their organoleptic and nutritional properties to a greater extent. And finally, then we have the whole area of valorization. Uh, you know, the potential uh, there for for you know for for um, uh, you know for for waste streams for extracting valuable compounds and for reducing the environmental impact. And of course, then we have these extra factors in the mix. We've had the the huge impact of the the global pandemic and the suffering of loss that's come with that and the impact it's had on, on, on food supply. And last, but by no means least, this dreadful situation in Ukraine at the moment and the suffering and displacement and loss that has caused for people and the ripples of that are being felt globally you know, in, in, in our food chains as well. So we have a lot of big problems and challenges at the moment. And green uh, food processing uh, really is, 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 you know, what I'm gonna to talk today falls under that heading. And really uh, green food processing is not the be all and end all in this it's not going to solve all of these problems uh, but it is a piece it's an important piece of the bigger jigsaw and i probably don't really need to tell anyone today what green processing is but i'll very quickly overview it it's based on the discovery and design of technical processes which will reduce energy in processing reduce water consumption in processing which will allow recycling of byproducts through you know things like biorefineries for example which will ensure a safe and healthy, uh, high quality product. And hopefully by the, the end of today's presentation, I will have demonstrated to you that modern electric fields certainly fits the bill in this regard and lends itself to do each of these uh, four things. What are moderate electric fields? I, I'm going to begin with a definition of Professor Sastry from 2008, and he defined uh, the use of moderate electric field processing as uh, the use of electrical fields at levels ranging from about one to a thousand volts per centimeter, uh, which is considerably lower than the electrical fields encountered in pulse electric fields. And the red line you see on the diagram here, uh, basically uh, it runs across there at 1000 volts uh, per centimeter. So basically above that red line would be pulse electric fields, below that red line is moderate electric fields. And in practical terms, you know, the, the, the strength of fields that are applied in moderate electric field processing typically wouldn't be even as high as 1,000 volts per centimeter. So probably you're up around 220 to 440 volts per centimeter as an upper li extreme limit. Uh, so that, that, that line moves down a little bit there. In terms of pulse electric fields, you know, there's a lot published on it. And in briefly, I can just say it's well understood the field strengths required for microbial inactivation and the specific energy inputs are well documented for microbial inactivation. They're well documented for things like sludge, disintegration, slightly lower field strengths, uh, slightly lower uh, specific energy inputs. The use of this technology for mass transfer is pretty well documented as well and pretty well understood. And then the other benefit of stress response in plants, uh, you know, you know, again, is, is, is in there, uh, albeit at a lower field strength and lower energy input, and of course, permeabilization of biological cells. So all of these areas are, you know, there's a lot of work being done on them in, in, in the context of pulse electric fields. Modern electric fields has potential in, in many, if not all of these areas, but it's not as well characterized or as well understood. So I don't have this, the equivalent boxes to give you for moderate electric fields. Next slide just refers to uh, the, um, you know, the, the, the waveform and the frequency and essentially um, moderate electric fields are different to pulse electric fields. 
modern electric fields generally involve much simpler, more direct application of alternating electrical current to, to, to foodstuffs. So there's no need for capacitors or pulse farming networks or any of those things, those complicated things that you get in pulse electric fields. And also in terms of frequency, a lot of modern electric field applications are use very simple power supplies that operate around 50 to 60 Hertz. So much lower, uh, you, you know, much lower frequencies than you'd encounter uh, with pulse electric fields. Although you do find some uh, power supplies that are used in modern electric field processing that operate at much higher frequencies, generally speaking, to avoid things like electrolysis. The next point I want to make in the definition of modern electric fields is the whole issue of, of ohmic heating. And ohmic heating in the definition of Sastry is really described as an attendant effect. So basically, uh, it's an attendant effect. Uh, and this, uh, you know, attendant effect may or may not be present. But overall, the application of modern electric fields uh, leads to interesting effects in biological materials. And to try and illustrate that you here, I'm going to show you a food system in which I'm going to place an apple. So we basically have an apple, for example, submerged in, in, in a liquid. And I'm going to use a pair of electrodes and place them in contact with the system. And within that apple and in the extracellular uh, liquid surrounding the apple, uh, basically th there's going to be ions, um, you, you know, kind of positive and negatively charged associated ions. And when we apply the electrical field, those ions move in response to that electrical field. And you can see them moving forwards and backwards. And essentially, this movement is very useful because you can use it to introduce compounds into food like cryoprotectants or brines or cures. We can also use it to extract compounds from foods or accelerate drying. And if we put enough energy into the food system, that frictional heat uh, will, 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 will lead to the attendant effect of ohmic heat. So essentially, um, MEF is not a new name for ohmic heating. I want to really emphasize that to you. Ohmic heating is an attendant effect. If you apply very, very uh, you know, low uh, electrical field strengths or low energies with MEF, you won't get really much heating at all. So MEF is well known for inducing ohmic heating, uh, but you can also apply MEF, as I said, at low field strengths and low specific energies and really avoid the heating phenomenon uh, quite, you know, more or less completely. Equally with, with PEF, which is often classed as a non-thermal technology, those of those of us who have worked with, with PEF, uh, particularly for things like microbial inactivation, where you're putting in quite high energies, uh, you know, you certainly do get a, some degree of, of heating, which is, is ohmic in nature. So ohmic heating is the attendant effect uh, from the frictional heat generation uh, by the application of the electrical current. And moderate electric fields, as I said, is, is a more accurate description or categorization. Um, to give you a little bit of a history, the application of electricity to foods goes back as far as the 1920s, um, where the first publication on MEF was, was introduced. Uh, you got things like uh, increasing dew shield uh, as far back as 1949 and ex enhanced extraction of sucrose from sugar beet, uh, an application or a publication in that area emerged in 1957, blanching 1975. Probably one of the milestone ones was really the, the, it's, it's, it, the proposed use for continuous heating of particulates in 1987, and that kind of generated quite a lot of interest in it at the time. And then we've had you know, a lot more recent publications then that have emerged since uh, in areas like drying or juice extraction or blanching or extraction or cell permeabilization and areas like that. Looking at the literature very, very quickly over the past 30 years, I've excluded 2022. Uh, in total for pulse electric fields, there's about 2,458 publications in that 30 year window. Moderate electric fields, uh, has a significant number of publications also, about 840, but not nearly the same volume as pulse electric fields. Just very quickly, in terms of the milestones and their impact on publications, um, just very quickly, um, as I said, heat processing of particulates, you know, began to be talked about in the, in, in the early 90s. And, uh, you know, you see a little blip in the number of publications around that time. IFT awarded a, you know, gave it an award in 1996, and that again there was a little blip in, in, in the number of publications around that time. Its association with electroporation around 2000, but it's really since 
I think, tr you know, to, you know, uh, about 2004 onwards that the increase in publications has really, uh, you know, come to the fore, 2014 onwards. Uh, so you've seen kind of this sort of exponential increase in the number of publications. Now, whether publications lead to commercial traction or not, that remains to be seen, really. Uh, and again, this also, you can see this the same kind of trend, really, in citations as well. I, I won't go into that in, in, in any detail. If we look within the publications at the commodities that the majority of the research has been done on, um, really, it's a lot of it is in mainstream foods. So juices and vegetables and meat and fruits and dairy, a lot of the publications are, are really looking at, at this technology as an alternative to conventional methods. So what I'm going to do now is just focus on the thermal application of um, MEF. And to illustrate that to you here, I'm just going to demonstrate the simplicity of it. I've chosen three objects. I've got two metal forks and some electrical cabling. And I'm now about to show you something that's uh, I'm going to do in a controlled environment. It's very, very dangerous. You should never try this at home. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect these two metal forks uh, to the electrical cable, and I'm going to connect a plug to the far end of that. And then I'm taking uh, a food product such as these uh, breakfast sausages, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert the forks into either end of the uh, of the sausage. And once I've got the forks in place, I'm going to turn on the AC power supply and turn up the voltage to around 140 volts. And what we're going to do is we're going to monitor the sausage temperature with an infrared camera. And what you can see here, looking at the camera, you can see the rapid and uniform increase in the temperature of the sausage. Now realize this is surface temperature, uh, but it's real time footage and it gives you an idea of the speed at which uh, the sausage is heating. And that essentially, in a simplest sense, is what modern electric field heating is. All that's happening, as I said, is we're passing electrical current through the, the, the uh, sausage via the forks and this frictional um, heat generation is occurring, which is, as I said, is, is what you're seeing on the infrared camera. So basically, uh, MEF is, is really, as I've shown to you on the previous slide, it's an extremely simple technology. And, you know, by virtue of its simplicity, the greenness uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, becomes apparent. And I'll discuss this on the next slide. And this greenness, as I said, is, is possibly why it will have uh, uh, you know, a, a particularly good role to play in the future uh, of, of food manufacturing. So where does, uh, you know, this green heating and process intensification, where does that come from? Um, well, MEF can give both of these things. And um, if we compare it to conventional methods, which rely on conduction and convection based heating, I just want to make a few points about green heating. And as we all know, looking at this energy balance here, you have to supply the same energy input to heat a certain mass of food, regardless of whether you're doing that with MEF or conventional means. However, uh, the big difference with MEF is uh, the uh, conversion efficiency. You can convert about 95% of the electrical energy into heat uh, under MEF conditions, whereas with conventional heating, that's reduced to about 50%. So all things being equal, you have a lower power input for a given temperature rise with, with, with MEF. Now that's an attractive option for a factory of the future, which is possibly relying on renewable electricity, uh, you know, for, for its, its, its energy supply. But, you know, it does also other competing technologies in, in the market for, for, you know, for heat generations. For example, combined heat and power or CHP or just regular recovery of energy as well. Um, you know, and, and you know, certainly MEF has lower emissions, say, for, than, for example, say something like CHP, uh, and, and it may be slightly greener in that way. But as I said, there are other energy efficient technologies out there. So green heating by itself isn't enough. The second point about MEF relates to really the whole area of process intensification. And if we look at power input and the time aspect in the above equation, um, in an ideal situation, the more power you put in, the less time it takes to elevate the temperature of a food. And you know, that works well in liquids where you have convection-based heat transfer. But in 
products like solids, uh, you know, for example, large diameter cooked meat products, you know, if you put more power into the system because of conduction, all you end up doing is heating, overheating the outer surface of the product while you're waiting for the, 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 the cold spot to, to reach the target temperature. So, you know, that, 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 that's certainly, uh, you know, th th that's, that's not good in terms of, of conventional heating. So the volumetric nature of MEF, by contrast, it really opens the door, uh, you know, to, to uh, you know, to, 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 to this, uh, you know, it, it really releases the, 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 the food processor from the shackles of con, uh, conductive based uh, heat transfer. And to illustrate this to you here, if you can see uh, this slide here, this is an example of conventional heating of a meat product. And if we place the meat product in a heating media like steam or immerse it in hot water, uh, the outer surface heats first, and then the heat transfers to the center of the product. And depending on whether or not your oven is preheated or not, you know, these two lines, one or other of these two lines represents the surface temperature. The brown line represents a preheated oven, and the red line represents an oven that's heating up at the same time as the product. By contrast, your center temperature lags behind. So you have this lag in the, in the, in the core temperature uh, and you end up overheating the surface as a result of that. Some very nice work uh, to illustrate the beauty of volumetric heating is some work we did a few years ago on shrimp. And the diagram on the left is basically a series of time temperature profiles for the head, the body and the tail of a, sh of a shrimp, which is heated by steam. And on the right hand side, the diagram is the head, the body, the tail of, of a similar size shrimp, but this time heated by, uh, by meth. Now, the name of the game in shrimp processing is to elevate the uh, cold spot of the shrimp to a temperature of 72 degrees centigrade. And that's what this line that I've drawn across there shows. And if we extend lines upwards, uh, we can basically see uh, from these vertical lines that the tail hit the target temperature in only 24 seconds. The body took 44 seconds, while the head took 68 seconds when you heated that shrimp by steam. So what you ended up doing there is you end up completely overheating the, the tail while you're waiting for the cold spot to hit the target temperature. By contrast, on the right hand side, uh, the MEF heated shrimp, it took 35 seconds for all locations to heat the, the, the target temperature. So none of this variability in temperature that you got with conventional heat. And that's further illustrated on the lower diagrams where we look at the influence of different shrimp sizes. And you can see here uh, the blue diagrams on the left, the three bars on the left hand side are for a larger shrimp. And you can see, you know, again, that variation between the head, the body and the tail. And then for a smaller shrimp where we still have the variation between the head, the body and the tail, but the time is quite different. So you could have a mixture of big and small shrimps uh, heating at the same, uh, you know, in the same system and huge variability between them in terms of the rate of, 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 of heat. By contrast, uh, the MEF heated shrimp, large or small, heated, you know, at the same rate. So we would no statistically significant difference between the, the, them in terms of the, the time it took for them to reach their target temperatures. So MEF gave us a much more uniform treatment and required a shorter heating time or shorter time to reach uh, the 72 degrees centigrade. Orientation on the, of the shrimp in the electrical field, just to make a point or two about that. Uh, if we look here at two scenarios, uh, we have the shrimp uh, on the left hand side is at right uh, angles to the electrodes or par is parallel to the field. The shrimp in the green box is at right angles to the field or, or, or parallel to the uh, electrodes. And if you look at the time it takes to reach the, the target temperatures, yeah, there's a slight difference between them. Uh, you know, it, it takes a little bit longer uh, when the, the shrimp is parallel to the field than when it's perpendicular to the field. But if you go back to the previous diagram, you know, where I showed you that, you know, the difference within a steam heated shrimp, you know, it, it's a very, very small difference, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of the time. So the orientation, sure, it's a factor, but it's, 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 it's not a very big influencer, if you like, on the, on the heating rate. The number of shrimps, again, just to quickly show this, one shrimp, two shrimp, three shrimps, four shrimps, you know, in the same volume, 
heated at the same rate it didn't make any difference so you know again that's uh, you know again pointing to the uniformity of volumetric heat one other quick point on volumetric uh, uh, heating and so on um the benefits of moderate electric fields are also reported in terms of uh, the maximum particle size you can get away with you know Typically, with conventional heat exchangers, it's around a 25 millimeter max particle size diameter you would be hoping to, 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 to stay under. Uh, whereas with, um, with moderate electric fields, you can go, go up to much, much larger diameters, you know, and you can also have much larger percentage or much larger amounts of solids, you know, about 35 to 40 percent solids would be as much as you would uh you know be expected to have with um conventional heating or, or you'd be hoping to have with conventional heating whereas with um moderate electric fields you can have much more concentrated uh, solutions with about 50 to 70 percent solids in there so what that does is it it allows for a potential reduction in process water and you know gives you energy savings that way but it also allows you to heat more concentrated uh, foods and know potentially reduce your transport costs as well as a result of that um another quick point about two phase systems uh in in situations where you know for example the red solid particles you see here uh surrounded by the blue liquid uh where in situations where they have similar uh, or identical electrical conductivity well then basically both will heat uh, simultaneously uh, to reach the the the, uh, the the target temperature at the same time, if the conductivity of the liquid uh, or, or of the solid is lower than the liquid, well, what you end up doing in that situation is you end up overheating the liquid while you're waiting for the solid to come up to temperature. And if the the converse is the case, uh, you end up overheating the solids while you're waiting for the liquid liquid to come up to temperature. Now that behavior. Uh, varies a little bit as well if you have a static or a moving system uh, moving exacerbates the problem a little bit uh, you know particularly when the liquid has a higher conductivity uh, you know that the force convection or movement of the liquid uh, you know further exacerbates the problem uh, uh, you know and, and, and it further increases the differential between the two um, just in terms of electrical conductivity um, there are are many ingredients used in, in food processing and these ingredients have many many different conductivities uh, some ingredients have extremely low conductivities other ingredients like salt and so on have extremely high uh, conductivities and the trouble with conductivity is it's not a fixed value it increases with increasing temperature and this diagram here shows differing salt solutions and you can see at the same temperature the most dilute salt solution is the lowest conductivity and the most concentrated salt solution is the highest conductivity. But equally, you can see that the conductivity changes uh, as the temperature increases. Uh, so, the, the, you know, the, so conductivity is, is, is not a fixed uh, property. It varies with temperature. Where ionic ingredients have a, a, you know, a potentially big impact, it relates to how they're distributed in a product. And if we look at these three uh, images here, the image on top shows a, a situation where a meat product had uh, basically it's a brine or a saline solution injected in the center, but not at the edges. And you can see it pref you know, preferentially cooked the center and left the edges raw. In the second diagram here, you can see where the meat was immersed in a saline solution, which uh, you know, moved into the outer regions. Uh, whereas very little had or much less had permeated to the center. So you can see it preferentially heated the outer regions and left the center less cooked. And then in the third situation here where we got the curing right with tumbling and injection and so on, you got a much more uniform cook. Other parameters then, uh, things like fat content. Fat is not a, a good conductor. Um, and you can see here with increasing uh, fat content, you get uh, a decrease in conductivity um, and uh, you know a, a reduction in heating rate and this is particularly critical here looking at meat products again if you look at this uh, the image on the left hand side shows a meat emulsion where the fat particles are broken down into into globules and the image on the right shows an you know an entire meat product with marbling and basically 
from an electrical point of view, it's much easier for a current to flow around those, uh, those lobules in the emulsion. Whereas these solid you know, kind of uh, layers of fat act more like barriers and essentially uh, an increase in, in the percentage of this kind of fat has far more influence on electrical conductivity than an increase in the percentage of fat in an emulsion situation. Because you know, even though you're increasing the amount of fat, the current can still navigate its way around uh, the, the, the globules. Another important point is, you know, while MEF is, is uh, it, you know, is, is, is volumetric in its nature, um, the surrounding environment is crucially important. And basically, uh, this is some work we did some years ago with um, Salerno, uh, where, you know, we were heating a meat product in at room temperature. And what we were finding was extremely cold outer surfaces and cold spots at electrodes because the heat was being generated in the product, but it was been drawn away by this, the, the cold surrounding environment. So of course, what we ended up doing was we ended up putting the, 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 the product in a hot box and we were able to eliminate that particular problem. Other things that can be problematic are contact surfaces like electrodes, for example, big thick electrodes will really draw heat away from your product if they're not heated. Uh, so just be mindful of that you could have you know, a cold spot at, you know, in, in close proximity to an electrode uh, and, and have the hot spot in, in the geometric center of the product. The other thing is packaging, product packaging. And again, just in brief, you know, when we started off this work, we were always putting our electrodes in direct contact with meat. Um, but, you know, there was some work done by Sastry, for, for actually for one of the, the space shuttle missions where they developed a specific, uh, you know, a specific package with conductive regions on it. Uh, but since then, we've, uh, you know, we, we, we've been, uh, we, we've found casings and we've worked with meat products, even with metal clips on the end. And, you know, as long as the casing itself is conductive, it's actually possible to, to, to use moderate electric fields for, for heating uh, products in a sealed casing. So really, that's just summing up on, on heat processing. So a lot has been done. Uh, you know, on MEF and a lot is known about MEF in, in this regard. Uh, but, you know, it hasn't yet uh, achieved its true potential or hasn't yet found its niche. And I'll, I'll come back to that point at the end. The next part, then, I just want to talk about, uh, you know, the, 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 the non-thermal applications for MEF. And I suppose, is, is, is thermal all MEF can do? Is it, is it a, a one-trick pony? Um, or is it, you know, able to do other things? Um, so can you exploit this movement to introduce compounds or extract uh, compounds from, uh, from foods. So basically, uh, just looking at that for, from, from a microbial inactivation perspective for a moment. And as I've shown you, MEF can heat uh, foodstuffs, um, but is, is its inactivation of microbes purely based on heat? And if we look at some work from 27, 2017 on uh, Alicyclobacillus Acido terrestris. I have to always struggle to pronounce that one. Basically, it's a spore farmer that causes spoilage in, in, in products like apple juice. And this group did some very nice work where they matched the temperature profiles, um, 85, 90, 95, and 100 degrees centigrade, and they matched holding times. So basically, they heated um, this microbe under identical uh, thermal processing uh, conditions. And they looked at the impact that had on the survivors. So the, the, the bugs got the same thermal treatment. One treatment was delivered by MEF, the other was delivered by conventional means. And what these, this group found, they found the MEF treated products uh, that were heated to 100 degrees centigrade, uh, there was no survivors in the 100 degrees C heated uh, product uh, when it was heated by MEF, whereas they still had about 3.6 to 4.6 log of survivors following conventional heating. So that initial work very clearly suggests that there's potentially more going on than heat uh, when MEF is used to inactivate uh, microbes. A second study looked at uh, this as well, and it looked at it from a different perspective. It looked at two bugs, E. coli and salmonella, and these were looked at in uh, buffered peptone water and in apple juice. And basically, 
they, they heated the, the, the product to different sublethal temperatures, 55, 58, and 60 degrees C, at times ranging from zero to 30 seconds. And what they found was uh, the meth gave greater inactivation than conventional heating. So that again suggests there's something other than heat going on. And they followed up with some microscopy work and that showed there was something other than heat going on uh, you know, in, in, in the inactivation of the bugs. Uh, the last one then is just chemical because you know, electrochemistry is a, is a huge area and um, it's potentially another mechanism by which meth can be used to inactivate bugs. And this is some work done on E. coli at low temperatures, around 29 degrees centigrade. And it was work performed in a phosphate buffer. And basically, uh, you know, now phosphate buffer isn't, isn't the food product by any manner or means, but they found when electrical current was applied to, to this buffer uh, and the temperature was kept low, uh, you know, hydrogen peroxide was formed. And, you know, that also led to microbial inactivation. Um, so it, I suppose it's not a great example of, of a food, but, you know, it is suggestive of the potential of maybe some electrochemical effects going on as well uh, in, in terms of, 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 of inactivation. There's a lot more work been done on that, and I'm not going to, 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 to go into it in detail. I mean, the, the paper that I've shown you here on the upper left hand side is from 2009. And this was a situation where the temperature was kept below 25 degrees centigrade, certainly a sublethal temperature. And it showed that you could even keep the temperature that low, you could inactivate three logs of E. coli in less than six minutes. And that was then demonstrated to be down to uh, cell membrane damage induced by the electrical field. Um, the paper in the upper right hand corner here uh, was on fermented red pepper. Um, and basically, uh, they got uh, 2.5 love reduction in vegetative cells under moderate electric fields and they only got one log under conventional uh, heating. The lower left one is a kinetic study, and um, the D values under MEF were, were, were lower than conventional uh, D values. And finally, the, the lower right-hand side is for bacillus serious spores, and, you know, heated up to, to quite high temperatures, and, um, you know, uh, they found that MEF gave, you know, uh, you know, a, uh, a six, six log reduction, whereas uh, you know a conventionally heated alternative to the same temperature only gave a two log reduction. So it certainly would appear that modern electric fields are able to give more than just thermal inactivation when it comes to microbes. You know the suggestions of other things uh, going on. The last examples I just want to, to quickly mention before I move away from. Um, microorganisms is synergy between MEF and other technologies or synergy between MEF and antimicrobials. And the paper I've shown you there on the left hand side is from 2019 and it's where MEF was combined with UV and basically they found increased inactivation of microbes uh, you know up to two log with moderate electric fields or UVC alone uh, compared to UV or, or UVC alone. So they, they got, uh, basically, they, they got a, a, an increase of two log when they combined the two technologies compared to when these technologies were applied on their own. And, and that was attributed to, uh, you know, a synergy. And on the right-hand side then, where MEF was combined with an antimicrobial, and basically uh, they got a four to five log increase in microbial inactivation under those conditions. And again, that was attributed to a synergy uh, you know, down to maybe again membrane disruption and the, the ability of the, the uh, antimicrobial to, to penetrate into the, into the bug much more easily. So I suppose to sum up, when it comes to microbial inactivation, uh, there's more to MEF than just heat, uh, and there's also potential, as I said, for it to have synergies with, with, with other technologies. Um, so what then about non-microbial cells? Um, is, is MEF just you know, a, a one-trick pony when it comes to those cells? Is it only good for heating those cells or does it do other things? And the, the, the great uh, Nikolai Lubovka asked this question back in, in 2005 and he looked at potatoes and apples and you know, he was using uh, field strengths about 100 volts per centimeter but he was keeping the temperatures below 50 degrees centigrade. Um, 
and you know under those conditions uh there wasn't much heat damage going on but what he did find was you know a high degree of tissue damage and and again that was attributed to more kind of electroporation type uh, phenomenon uh, under those conditions and down at the bottom of the slide here a more recent review from 2019 looked at this you know in, in broader terms and again you know there's quite a strong suggestion in there that there's more going on than just pure heat when it comes to to uh to to uh, modern electric fields in terms of its disruption of of of, of things like plant, uh, cellular tissue and so on um you know it's certainly acknowledged that the, the, you know the, the the there's not that much data or there's a limited amount of data uh, you know in terms of non-thermal effects uh, and and there is a little bit of work to be done but it's certainly very suggestive that uh, meth has potential to do uh, you know to, to disrupt non-microbial cells as well um just staying with that for a second um and and a kind of a related area is really potato softening and um potato softening uh it, you know uh, prior to cutting for fries it's it's the biggest commercial success story for for pulse electric fields extraordinarily successful um and you know MEF has also been shown to have a, a softening capability now it's 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 not likely to compete with PEF I mean PEF is just you know with 1.8 kilovolts per centimeter and maybe up to 40 pulses which is extremely low energy you can soften potatoes uh you know prior to cutting them into fries and so on but MEF has also been shown to have this effect uh and just quickly skimming through it here on products like sugar beet and root veg you know albeit you know I, I i don't think it's not a competitor to, to to pef here because the times involved are a bit longer and the energy input is certainly higher uh, but it has certainly been shown to soften compared to conventional heat uh, and then more recent work on artichokes again more uniform softening compared to hot water and that softening taking place at a lower temperature and then with carrots more recently and um things like cabbages and radishes and turnips and potatoes so it certainly um has potential to soften things but i think pef has really found a, a very very good niche for itself in the softening area and um you know i i don't think meth can compete from an energy perspective or from a time perspective uh, in that regard in terms of um uh, expression and extraction then so kind of taking juice out of products and so on i mean traditionally um this is achieved by pressing feed materials you know squeezing them uh, in presses and so on and as far back as 2010 uh, eugene varbiev showed that this pressing process was improved by meth and they got you know an, an improved juice extraction yield uh, you know increased by about 30 percent uh very little impact on color and the quality was very very good um but the you know a big benefit there was the lower energy input it reduced the amount of energy required to get the juice out by 50 to 100 times so that's really great news in terms of, of process sustainability and then other work here on the right hand side again by eugene varbief uh you know where mef and pef was again applied uh, and and you know again th those technologies were both found to to nearly double juice yields, uh, and one of the other big benefits was um, they didn't need to cut up the product as 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 finely uh, because uh, of the volumetric nature of the the electrical energy passing through the the larger pieces. Uh, they didn't have to reduce the particle size as much, uh, so that again helped to reduce energy requirements. Uh, and again, both of these applications you know, are, are good news in terms of, of process sustainability. Um, you know, very quickly, um, you know, this has been demonstrated elsewhere as well. Uh, you know, this is work on, on uh, uh, beetroot cubes and you know, the diffusion of beet dye and so on. And again, you know, application of MEF increased the rate at which the dye diffused. Um, but also this can then extend into not just extraction, but also dehydration. And, um, you know, the, 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 uh, this is some work by Wang from, from a thesis in 1905, 
and they found that um, when, when MEF was used, uh, it was able to accelerate the, the drying because of the electroporation effect and the you know, enhanced rate of moisture migration out of the matrix. And the same over here on the right hand side, uh, you know, on apples and sweet potatoes, again, modern electric fields enhanced the rate of, of, um, of, of, of drying or speeded up the drying process. In terms of osmotic dehydration, then, uh, you know, again, um, you know, electroporation around all of this is good news because it, it helps mass transfer inwards and outwards. Um, you know, it, it, I, I won't go into this in, in great detail, but uh, in the interest of time, but for things like pairs, uh, you know, MEF enhanced the, the kinetics of water loss and, and sugar gain. Um, so and cut the process time, uh, you know, because of, of the enhanced permeability. And this has been demonstrated in other products like apples uh, and uh, strawberries and, uh, you know, even things like blueberries, where, um, you know, again, mass transfer was enhanced by the application of, of um, uh, you know, of, of, of moderate electric fields and, and that ultimately in an osmotic dehydration situation increased the, the, the you know the, the rate of drying and reduced the drying time um, other quick areas I'll just mention is um, uh, you know ohmic or meF assisted hydro distillation um, distillation as, as we, we, we most we all know is, is vaporization followed by condensation and hydro distillation is, is, is basically a standard method used for things like essential oils. Um, it's very energy intensive and, you know, basically, you know, when, when the, the objective of a lot of this work is, is looking at replacing traditional heat with modern electric fields. And, you know, it's certainly, um, you know, it's been shown to be very, you know, successful. There's 11 or 12 papers at this stage in that area. It's certainly much faster and certainly much more uh, energy efficient um and uh much more uniform in terms of heat generation um what it's been shown to do is is physically looking at microscopic images of the the, the oil glands your electroporation you can see the, the disruption of the glands from the uh you know electroporation effect and you know it, it gives a, a you know a comparable or superior quality product uh, and and better uh, process control as well and you know another application is in bioethanol concentration from fermented biomass. Uh, you know again it's been shown to speed all of that up, uh, albeit you know there's a need to be careful around this type of application in terms of electricity and 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 flammable liquids and so on. Um, so there's I suppose there's a little bit of work to be done there in terms of uh, you know making all of that safe and so on. Uh, but you know, still looks very, very promising in 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 that uh, regard. Um, I suppose just just to, to, again, um, recovery from waste. Again, this electroporation effect uh, can be used to you know enhance the whole recovery of of, of products from waste streams. Um, some work on Ceremi, uh, where you know things like catepsin protease, which is valuable. Um, you know, and uh, you know, it it, it 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 you know, its its removal stabilizes the ceremi, and meth was found to have potential in that regard. Other areas is coagulation from waste streams, again from ceremi, where you know protein is carried away in waste streams, and you know that heads into um, water treatment plants. So if you can coagulate it out and catch it before it reaches that point, it reduces BOD, and you know it's certainly been shown to have benefits there. And then the whole area of things like extra extracting pectin, for example, from orange peels, uh, you know, very, very good in that regard. Uh, and, you know, waste streams from, from uh, vineyards and so on, uh, you know, getting polyphenols out of those, uh, you know, that's all been enhanced by, by, um, by, by uh, meth. And, you know, blanching as well, uh, you know, in the interest of time, just, uh, you know, again, it, it, it saves energy. Uh, you know, you don't have to, to, to dice up the, the vegetables as, as severely. 
um, and uh, it reduces solute leaching and so on. And, and um, it speeds up the whole blanching process and uh, you know, gives a more uniform blanch as well. You're not overheating outer regions of, of product. So you get a more uniform color and texture and homogeneous texture uh, you know, in, in, in products when they're, they're blanched under MEF conditions. Final one then is just in peeling. And again, uh, you know, PEF has been shown to enhance uh, peeling, uh, but equally there are quite a number of papers suggesting um, that, that MEF has potential in this regard. And, um, you know, it, what it does, it, it allows, you know, the, the electroporation effect allows, uh, you know, the, the, the diffusion of lye more readily. Uh, so you can get away with lower lye concentrations, which that's good news environmentally because there's less of this uh, lye waste stream to dispose of. So it makes it a greener process. So in summing up then, I suppose there's many commercial applications out there uh, or potential commercial applications out there for MEF. Which ones are going to be the, 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 the ones with the greatest um, commercial success? And basically, uh, if we look at it, MEF in that regard, well, it, it certainly seems to fit the bill in terms of the concept of a green processing technology. Um, you know, it, it, it's more energy efficient in a lot of cases. It, you know, it lends itself to using less process water. Uh, it does give rise to recovery of, you know, from compounds from waste streams and still gives a good quality product at the end of the day. So it's good. It, it ticks the boxes in terms of green processing technology. Um, it can certainly make a contribution towards the societal challenges that I, I illustrated at the start. Um, it certainly has potential to improve the sustainability of food supply you know, by, by more energy efficient process and providing you know, uh, process intensifications and you know, enhancing yield and so on. Uh, it, 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 you know, for rising global populations where processes like extraction are becoming, you know, more important, uh, it has potential in that regard. Um, it does lend itself from a consumer perspective uh, to more minimally processed products and, and retain nutrient quality to a greater extent. Uh, and that's all good. And, you know, even for in areas like the aging global population, you know, structure modification and enhanced bioaccessibility and all that, uh, you know, there's a lot of potential for it in that regard. So there's a lot published, uh, yet it's still to find its, its, its true potential, I suppose. It's, it hasn't, uh, you know, it, it still hasn't had huge commercial traction as, as, as an operation so far. Um, and, and, you know, most of us who've worked with novel technologies for, for a while, we kind of realize really it's, it's a niche business. Um, you, know, it, it, you know, most emerging technologies can replace conventional methods, but it really has to be, uh, you know, uh, you know it, 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 it finds niches where it's really a, a no brainer for industry to change over to. And, you know, if you had asked me 15 years ago, um, where would I have said the greatest commercial application for pulse electric fields would be? At that time, I would have told you uh, that it would have been in, in microbial inactivation in beverages. If you had asked me at the time, would I have thought it was in, in, in softening of potatoes prior to cutting? I, 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 I would have been surprised, to be honest with you, but that's the reality of what's happened. Um, there's been a huge amount of publications in microbial inactivation, not nearly as many in, in, in potato softening, but that's the niche where, where it made sense and, and that's where it's been taken up. And the same can be said for other technologies, like, for example, high pressure processing. Again, you know, 30 years ago or 25 years ago, I would have said, uh, you know, it would have been, uh, you know, more extensively used in fruit juice processing and so on. But for kind of shucking oysters or producing guacamole, you know, you know, again, they were niches that made a lot of sense. And that's where industry have, have taken it up. So in terms of, of future prospects for MEF technology, um, you know, MEF and PEF, both of them are excellent technologies. Um, PEF is, you know, higher voltages, shorter times. Um, MEF, by contrast, is 
lower voltages and a lot of cases lower, you know, certainly lower voltages and longer times. Um, but MEF is 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 a certainly a cheaper uh, technology from a capital investment perspective. It's a simpler technology, and it also you know is is a thermal technology. So. For example, PEF suffers in terms of enzymes. It's not particularly great in terms of enzyme inactivation. Whereas, you know, if you have heat, uh, you know, from MEF, you, you don't have problems there. So, you know, these technologies certainly have potential in, in the, the pasteurization and sterilization of, of foods in the future. But, um, you know, things like, like, you know, PEF, for example, rather than it being called pasteurization, um, you know, it tends to be used more for shelf life extension. Um, and there's a subtle difference there. Um, you know, all you're doing with shelf life extension is, is you're allowing a processor to extend the shelf life and, and you know, enhance the reach of their, their product from, from the, the manufacturing site. Uh, but you're not claiming it to be an alternative to conventional pasteurization. You're just simply using it as, as a tool to enhance shelf life. Um, it, you know, there could be potential for MEF in speeding up heat processing, for example, in preheating. Uh, that's certainly an area where, where it could have a lot of potential. Cooking with MEF is certainly very, you know, a very, very um, good application. Uh, you know, it, you know it, and even it could lend itself to smarter cooking where, you know, if you were able to monitor in line, for example, um, certain phase changes in, for example, the, the cooking of a meat, you know, protein denaturation and the phase change, you know, if you could pick something like that up um, electrically, you could tailor the cooking to optimize the transition through phase changes. Um, areas like blanching and softening and peeling and expression and extraction and drying and hydro distillation, certainly a lot of potential in those areas, um, you know, the economics ultimately at the end of the day will be very, very important. Um, and really the applications must be no brainers for industry. Um, you know, having a marginally superior process is not enough to convince them to change uh, from, from, from what they're currently doing. As I said, it, it needs more than that. Um, one area where I do believe there's huge potential for these technologies is really in 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 the circular bioeconomy and in biorefineries. Um, you know, th that's very much a, a situation where you're not going in and trying to displace, for example, a plate heat exchanger from a juice manufacturer who's quite happy with with that technology. Um, you know, a lot of these facilities are built as greenfield sites and built with sustainability in mind. And I really do think that's uh, an area where. Uh, there's, there's, there's much more potential for, for, for this technology. So look at, that's, that's really a very quick overview of, of uh, a very broad overview of modern electric field technology. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, take any questions you may have. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to mention uh, the fact that um, we're hosting um, two events next November in, in our university. And the first is the IFT, NPD, um, the uh, non-thermal processing workshop and short uh, course uh, from the 4th to the 6th of November in Dublin. And then immediately after that, uh, we have the EFOST International Conference from the 7th to the 9th of November in Dublin as well. And uh, we'd really love to, to see you there at, at those events. Uh, as I said, they run sequentially, so you can go from one to the other and uh, you know they're both in 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 close proximity to each other um, in the city of Dublin. So uh, just ju just to highlight those to you, and I, I thank you very much for your attention today. And you know I'm happy for any comments or, or questions. Uh, now thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Professor Ling. And now let's start the question and answer portion of the webinar. Remember to turn on your microphone to ask a question directly or to write them on the chat. I have a few comments from Professor Torres. If you want to comment out loud. Okay, uh, thank you, Jim, for a great presentation. I was looking forward to this morning. Uh, two questions. One is uh, on your introduction. Uh, 
A increase in food production is certainly the challenge for uh, the next generation. So Viviana, Alejandra, all those in the younger faculty that I can see on the screen, please, you have a big challenge ahead of you. Uh, however, we tend to always uh, talk about increased production and uh, we forgot that the, the real challenge is to reduce the inequality. And I think that's much more challenging. So as we work in all this uh, very advanced technologies, how can those technologies help reduce the inequality? I mean, I just look at in our side of the world, uh, we have places like Haiti, where the inequality is atrocious. And then we have countries like the US where the inequality is a lot less, not, not zero, but a lot less. So how can this technology help reduce those inequalities? Because they produce war, um, migration of population, social conflicts, uh, cause a lot of trouble. I think in terms of that side of things, it's it's really more just the environmental benefit and you know a, a greener processing and reduced emissions. It would be in that regard that that would be really where they they would um, have their strength. I mean, are you talking about kind of building systems for application in underdeveloped regions? You know, maybe harnessing solar power for producing, you know. Um, uh, clean water or something like that is is that what you had in mind um or um uh, it, it uh, i i think that it's more it's more around the the, the sustainability and the the um the health and nutrition is it, it would be my view and certainly when it comes to this technology that would be where it, it would have its 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 benefits um but for sure i strongly acknowledge what you're saying um in terms of that's a major challenge for sure I would think when you show the image of uh, a processing facility uh, based on solar power, and since this uh, application reduces uh, the, the use of power, uh, since when you are in a, in, a, in a poorly developed country, you don't have a, an energy infrastructure. So having something that's more uh, self-contained, uh, yeah. use uh, better use uh, whatever commodity they have, uh, to extend the shelf life. I mean, you know, the food losses are the major cause of uh, these food inequalities. Yeah, absolutely, no, for sure. Yeah, if, when you say it from that sense, absolutely, yeah. The, anything that, that reduces food food loss or food waste is, is, is certainly good in that regard, absolutely. And, and they do have potential, all, you know, more, most if not all of the technologies to, to you know, improve extraction and, 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 and get, um, you know, salvage kind of, from from waste streams and side streams and restaurant materials and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Morales. Mariana, would you like to make your question? I know we are we run out of time, but if you have a few minutes to go for, yeah. thank sure. you. I can see the question actually. Um, it was about meth technology. Could it replace thermal pasteurization at an industrial level? Absolutely, it could. Most definitely, it could. And you, you also asked, would it be easier than PEF? I suppose PEF is an excellent technology uh, and excellent for you know for vegetative cells and microbial activation of, of vegetative cells. It's excellent. PEF, when it comes to enzyme inactivation in, in things like fruit juices, it's a bit more of a mixed bag. You, you, you know, you can, some enzymes respond quite well and are inactivated by PEF, uh, but other enzymes don't respond well to PEF and, and they're not inactivated. So um, from, from a pasteurization perspective, microbially, um, you know, both technologies are good, but where MEF would have an edge would be uh, in terms of, um, you know, the, the, its ability to, uh, the, the thermal aspect of it and its ability to inactivate enzymes. Um, Thank you very much. Will I, will I read down through, will I go through the, the questions as they are in the chat maybe? Is, is that? Yeah, yeah if that, is that okay with yeah, you? Yeah, no problem okay, at all. Great. Yeah, just look at here. Does it affect nutrition quality of the food treated with meth? Um, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, from a nutrition perspective, certainly when it comes to solids, um, if you're heating a solid in a volumetric way um, compared to a conventional way, um, 
when you conventionally heat a solid, you 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 have to, by its nature, unless the solid is quite small, you have you you tend to overheat the outer regions of the solid while you're waiting for the the center to come up to temperature, and you avoid that with meth, you know, under the right conditions because you're heating everything uniformly, so that nutritional imbalance in terms of nutrient degradation between the outer surface and the inside of, 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 the, of the, uh, the, the product, you certainly improve yield as well as a result of that, but you can also help to retain nutrients that are lost in, in cookout and, and also avoid excessive heat uh, denaturation of them. So from that perspective, um, you, you know, the nutritional quality certainly in solids can be improved or retained to a better extent uh, with, with MEF. There's also potential in terms of bioaccessibility and bioavailability as well. There's been some work done on that. And, um, you know, again, in, and PEF is indeed also uh, to enhance bioaccessibility and, and bioavailability and even to stress products, uh, you know, to, to kind of kickstart metabolism and, and improve uh, nutrient profiles and so on. So, so from that perspective, there's also potential. Um, from, I'm just reading down to the question. Consumers are looking for minimal processing and less thermal degradation. Yeah, so I, no, I, 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 there is potential, uh, certainly from a minimal processing pr perspective. Um, in juices, for example, if you're in liquids, if you're trying to, if you're just using it as an alternative to, to pasteurization and you're following the same rules, you're just using it as a more energy efficient um, method for heating or whatever, uh, nutritionally, it's probably on the par with conventional processing uh, for, for liquids or beverages and things like that. Um, nutrient quality. Yeah, would you explain a bit more effect of, of MEF on nutrient quality? So, 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 so may, I think I've probably touched on that. MEF, I suppose, and PEF indeed as well, the disruptive nature of them, you know, can help to release compounds from the inner structure of foods and make them more bioaccessible. Um, PEF has been shown to stress products as well, and that's also been used with technologies like, for example, high intensity light uh, in mushrooms to, you know, elevate vitamin D levels in mushroom. So stressing effects can, can be certainly beneficial from a nutritional perspective, um, you know, particularly in, 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 in things like, like plants, for example. So there, there's potential uh, there. Um, and just reading down to the, the next question, and you were talking about saline solutions, but I didn't understand very much which case you use them. Okay, I, I suppose the saline solutions really was just an example um, really just to demonstrate uh, the impact of conductivity on, uh, you know, on, on heating rate and how, you know, um, yeah, you, you, you for sure, you, you wouldn't be normally heating saline solutions like that, but you could have a meat product with, you know, zero, you know, maybe a low salt meat product with quite a low level of salt in it. And, you know, you can have meat products with salt levels of two and sometimes even 3%. So it was really just, uh, more about making the point that um, conductivity can vary in, in, in substances and that can certainly influence the, the, the rate of heating um, and, um, you know, and, and, and that rate of heating then depending on the starting conductivity, um, you know, the more conductive product will, will the conductivity will increase even more uh, over the duration of a heat process than, than a less conductive product. Um, the frequencies, uh, next question, and the frequencies you use seem to overlap with those of plasma generation. Is that a mere coincidence? That's a good question. And I, I don't work with plasma myself, um, but really the, the, the 50 hertz frequencies, I mean, the, re the, the, the reason I like 50 hertz uh, power supplies is, is they're low cost. Um, they're off the shelf, uh, you, you know, you can buy them relatively easily. Um, it, the, the, with 50 hertz, the one issue you potentially have is the issue of, of um, uh, electrolysis of electrodes. If you try to use stainless steel electrodes at 50 or 60 hertz, you will get electrolysis and rusting of the electrode. So, so you have to use more stable electrode materials. Um, and if you do that, you can avoid that phenomenon completely. 
Um, when you, you know, the way, another way to avoid that uh, is, is really, um, uh, you know, if you, want, if you are in hell bent on using stainless steel, um, the only way around electrolysis there then is to use a higher frequency power supply. Um, so um, that's where the, those much higher frequencies that I mentioned uh, come into play. Um, in terms of plasma generation, as I said, I, I think it's probably more a coincidence or, or again, maybe it's down to the price of the power supplies, but it's not a technology uh, plasma that I know much about. Um, does MEF enhance pesticide removal or does it enhance electroosmotic diffusivity? Um, I, I, certainly in terms of the electroosmotic diffusivity, it certainly has potential. Um, I can't recall, uh, although I, in the back of my head, I think I've come across a paper uh, on pesticide removal. But, you know, I suppose if you think about it, you know, if you have electroporation and you are disrupting membranes and, and you know, if, if pesticides are in matrices and, you know, they're either membrane located in membranes or within the, the, the cellular material, if you're, if you're bringing that disruption to play, uh, you know, th there certainly is potential for it to enhance pesticide removal. Uh, do you think oh, MEF can be used as an alternative to food irradiation? Oh, very good question. Um, I suppose the beauty of, of food irradiation, food irradiation is a fantastic technology. Um, and and it, it, you know, depending on which form of it you use, uh, it really penetrates into, into materials and you can irradiate packaged um, products and so on, and even pallets of foods with food irradiation. So, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of food irradiation, I have to confess. And it's a shame that the technology has been lost to us um, uh, as a technology because of really poor information released to consumers and the whole narrative getting away from the industry. Um, can it be used as an alternative to food irradiation? Yeah, for pasteurization, for sure it can, um, and, and would be much lower cost, because bear in mind with, with food irradiation, particularly kind of gamma ray radiation and so on, like the, the cost of the facilities is very, very high, and you need big, thick concrete walls and so on. Um, so it, yeah, it would be a, a, a lower cost alternative for, for pasteurization, say, than, than, than food irradiation would be. Um, this type of technology, if it's used on a huge scale in industry, how simple or difficult is the maintenance process and who sh what should be taken into account? Sure, that's a, that's a good question. And, uh, you know, to, to answer it, it is a very scalable technology um, and can be used on, at, at very large scales and um, has been used at very, very large scale. Um, in terms of maintenance, from a maintenance perspective, it's 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 as I've shown to you in in, in some of the images there. It's it's quite as you know it's it's not a very complex technology. You know, if you compare it say to high pressure processing, where you have huge pressures and huge vessels and lots of seals that can degrade and break down and so on. Um, you know, there's a lot of maintenance associated with that in in high pressure processing. Whereas here, really, it's you know, it, it, with the right power supply or the right electrode material, your electrodes are pretty stable. Uh, you know, they're not going to to, to degrade. Um, you know, you know, so there's, there's not that much to maintain, really, uh, in, in in terms of 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 um, you know, other than the the the, the usual routine uh, kind of maintenance that you would, you would have to do around you know continuous systems if if that's what you're you're interested in. Um, let me see, is there anything else? So uh, let's, if, think, if you don't mind, uh, um, we have a last one from uh, Professor Torres, which is, would you mention the electric point being a low temperature point? What are the solutions? And I would like to ask one last one from me, which is perhaps the, the answer will change in 20 or 30 years, but what will be the application that you think that, you think that fits better to to this you're you're asking me to to uh to gamble uh, <laughs> in, in terms of uh, a recommendation i i wish i i wish i knew i i wish i knew the answer to that i i really do think the the future for this technology i think for many 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 years i've spoken to 
the conventional food processing industry about these technologies. And they're always very, very interested in what you have to say and very, very curious about what, what you have to say. But, you know, unless you have a kind of a really no brainer type um, application, you know, they're, they'll, they'll tend to stick doing what they're doing because they're comfortable with it and they understand it and they've got good technical support around it and so on. So I think the future for it is, is in the biorefineries and in the, the factories of the future um, that are looking at valorization of waste streams and are looking at the circular economy. I really do think that that's where there's really going to be traction for this technology as a, you know, a heating method or as a means for inducing um, stress in, in materials or, or as a means for enhancing extraction. I, I really think that's where the future lies for, for moderate electric fields. Um, not sure, there was another question, I think, in there that you asked me. And no, uh, I think, can, I, can I change my question, uh, Viridiana? Uh, go ahead. We, we, we're running out of time, but go ahead. I know, I know, I know, I know. But this, don't answer my, my previous question. Uh, in, in many technology in relation to the example, we look for uh, biomedical applications and where there's real money. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. is there a way, because I always see those applications as a way to get the capital and then, well, is there a little, a few hours left on the processing facility, let's do some food, right? That's why we do yeah, it in yeah, yeah, facility. Yeah. So do you yeah. see some applications in other non-food? Absolutely, in any chemical engineering, biomedical, certainly any application where certainly heat is, is required. Oh, it, 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 it certainly does, there's certainly great potential there for it. Um, no question about that. Um, you know, I suppose in biomedical, I, I see applications for things like light, you know, for decontamination of, of filling lines and things like that. Um, lots of application you know or potential in in, in that type of area um you know biomedical around you know again around fermenters and things like that you know you know if, if you've got kind of a biomedical facility maybe you know you can s potential to s stimulate fermentation and enhance fermentation and the rate of fermentation uh by applying low field uh, electrical current uh is, is, is something that there has been work done on um, and 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 that's that's an area for sure where, where there could be potential, um, you know, extraction maybe of 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 if, if there's medical compounds that are in plant matrices or whatever, you know, again technologies like pulse electric fields and moderate electric fields might be very capable of of enhancing the rate and yield of extraction. So yes, for sure, um, absolutely, uh, there could be potentials in in biomedical, absolutely. Um, I suppose my focus tends to be more food and increasingly moving towards food waste and that, but um, absolutely you're, you're right. Uh, maybe I should change my mindset and, 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 and look to that, to that area. I do some work with, with biomedical companies, I have to confess, um, on, on, on small projects, um, more around light technologies really. Anyway. Well, Again, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Link, for this exciting talk. And thank you all for participating. Please keep down and check our website or Facebook page or Instagram account for more information regarding our next presentation. And again, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much, Professor Link. Thank you very and much. Thank you, and everybody. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. See you in Dublin. Thank you. <laughs> bye, bye bye. Bye bye. Let us know if we can help with anything. Absolutely. Mariana I, I... and I will be will be pleasure helping. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.